Okay, let's get started. I know traffic was terrible uh, because of the flooding. Um, and so I think people again will be trickling in uh, one by one. Um, I'd like to remind everybody today is the one year anniversary of the shooting at the um, school, the high school in Florida. Um, if any of you guys have been listening to NPR, they've had a great series, you know, on this week um, about the aftermath and what things are like uh, one year later. We think we make so many advances in medicine, and yet uh, we still can't figure out what drives somebody to do something as seemingly senseless as that. Um, but let's turn to a brighter topic, and that is our talk for today. Uh, which will be delivered by Dr. Ramirez. Uh, Julio Ramirez um, uh, came to the University of Louisville in 1987 as a fellow um, in infectious diseases, and a mere eight years later, he was division chief of infectious diseases, uh, a position that he has held since uh, that time. He is also the uh, director of their fellowship program, uh, the HIV clinic, uh, the Bone and Joint Infection Program, uh, Global Health, and his uh, clinical research um, enterprise that he has. I think uh, most of us who come to the uh, Grand Rounds um, are familiar with the fact that Dr. Ramirez's major interest has been in community-acquired pneumonia um, and the epidemiology um, of uh, community-acquired pneumonia. But many of you guys out in the audience have probably also had the opportunity to work with Dr. Ramirez and his big group um, and know that um, he really has clinical research down pat. I always enjoy listening to his lectures because it's so much fun to listen to somebody who very, very clearly um, enjoys the career path that he has laid out in academic medicine. And with that, I'll ask Dr. Ramirez to uh, come deliver his talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <clears throat> and uh, the idea today is to give you an overview of the topic of multidrug resistant uh, bacteria and what is that we are doing uh, at the University of Louisville Hospital, at the VA Hospital, for the prevention and treatment of this um, uh, problem. The outline of my presentation, <clears throat> initially I'm going to uh, briefly uh, describe some definitions of multidrug resistant bacteria. Then I'm going to jump into the, the microbiology. How is that bacteria develop uh, resistant to antibiotics? Then I'm going to uh, exemplify what will be um, the pathophysiology or the pathogenesis of one patient developing an infection. And then based on this pathogenesis, what areas we can uh, have some action. Um, going into the, into the definition, if we put a simple structure of the bacteria, uh, this would be a bacteria when we have the, the DNA, circular uh, DNA, we imagine the ribosome, the cell membrane, the cell wall, and the, and the capsule. When we give an antibiotic, um, we know that the antibiotic is going to go there, it's going to attach to a receptor in the bacteria. And we know, for instance, you know, beta-lactam antibiotics are going to attach to the cell membrane, and you know, the amino glycosides will attach to the ribosomes, the quinolones will attach to the, to the DNA of the bacteria. It's going to be always a, a receptor. <clears throat> and when we discuss uh, in general terms how is that the bacteria develop resistant to antibiotics, there are some bacteria that is the definition of intrinsic resistance. And intrinsic resistance means that there's something in the genes of the bacteria that produce a protein, and this protein is going to make the antibiotic ineffective. Then, and these proteins um, are going to alter the, the receptor in some area, or sometimes these proteins are going to produce enzymes that are going to destroy the antibiotic. The classical beta-lactamases are going to destroy the uh, antibiotic. Intrinsic resistance is that the gene that is going to have this protein is always present in the bacteria. Um, in this case, every member of the family or the species of the bacteria is going to be resistant. 
Then, for instance, uh, if we have a Pseudomonas aeruginosa, well, we know that every Pseudomonas aeruginosa is going to be resistant to ampicillin. We don't need to do susceptibility. We know that every Pseudomonas aeruginosa is going to be resistant to cefazolin. This will be the intrinsic resistance. Now, this, of course, is not the one that we are interested. We are uh, interested <clears throat> in the issue of acquired resistance. We're interested in the issue that the, the bacteria used to be susceptible to the antibiotic. But now, after a certain period of time, the bacteria is able to develop new resistance. Now, we mentioned that, that you, to have new resistance, usually you, the bacteria needs to form a new protein. And to have a new protein, you need to have a new genetic composition. You need to change your DNA. Then, when we're discussing bacterial resistance, we're thinking that this bacteria somehow was able to change the, the DNA. So the bacteria needs to have new genes. And then the acquired resistance, when you read about acquired resistance, there are two possibilities for the bacteria to have a new gene. And one is that there is a mutation of the genetic composition, and this may happen. Uh, but the most important one and the most common one that is the problem that we're having now is that the bacteria just acquire new genetic information. They just acquire the genes and they incorporate new genes. <clears throat> and without going into a, a detail of the of you know uh, genetics, but we know that the most common way that bacteria acquire new genes is through plasmids. The plasmids are these circular elements of DNA, the circular DNA, that the bacteria just acquire from a bacteria from the same family. This is an pseudomonas giving this resistant gene to another pseudomonas, or the bacteria from different families. This may be a Klebsiella, where resistant gene is plasmid, that is given the plasmid to an E. coli. Then these plasmids are moving in between families of bacteria or in between different type of bacteria. Um, not only this, we also know that these plasmids are circular DNA, they multiply by itself. And this circular DNA not only has the gene, there is a problematic gene for a resistor, but these plasmids keep acquiring new genes. And then these plasmids give a bacteria multi-resistant, not resistant to one antibiotic, but they have multiple genes that allow the bacteria to acquire multi-resistant just with one transfer of the chromosome. Then when we discuss uh, the susceptibility of the bacteria today, we can say that we have susceptible bacteria, will be you not know, the expected susceptibility. You may have one or two uh, resistant to some antibiotics. Uh, MDR, now, um, when you're doing clinical research, you always, when you read MDR, you need to look at materials and methods. What is that the investigators call MDR? Because there's not a single definition. The most common definition is that you are going to have one resistant antibiotic for at least for three different groups, but they are different definitions. Then you have the XDR, extreme drug resistance. Now you have multiple uh, groups of antibiotics that you have resistant. And finally, we have the, the PDR, the pan drug resistant, is the one that will look at the susceptibility of this an R attached to all the antibiotics. And essentially, we run out of antibiotics to treat these bacteria. And on and off, we have some of these bacteria uh, here. This is what people discuss, you not know, the post-antibiotic era. Now you have some bacteria that you look at all your antibiotics, nothing works. Um, then this is the, the spectrum that we have. Now, um, then what do we call multidrug resistant organism at the university hospital, the VA hospital, what is an, or sometimes, you no, know, what is an MDRO? Well, um, there's not strict rules, but probably the rule is that there's a bacteria that, of course, is going to be resistant to different antibiotics, but also is we put in consideration what is the, the clinical and epidemiological significance of the bacteria. And then in this, uh, because, for instance, um, and you have then in different hospitals, people can call multidrug resistant bacteria a different organism because there's not a specific definition. But from the infection control perspective, 
This is the definition. And then in this hospital, this is the list of MDRO. In the other hospital, you may have 90% concordance, but you may have some other organisms based on the local epidemiology. Then this will be the definition. Okay, I will stop here with the with the then this is a multi drug resistant bacteria. Now moving into the second topic that is the, the microbiology. Now I want to let's try to understand a little how is that these bacteria develop multi resistant to a, to different antibiotics. If we go back again to the to the scheme of the bacteria, these bacteria acquire a plasmid. This plasmid has genes that bring this uh, resistance. And, and probably um, the most important, most of the action in multi resistant uh, organisms happen for in the context of our beta-lactam antibiotics. Because we know that, that uh, the beta-lactam antibiotics, all the, the penicillin, the cephalosporin, the monobactam, the carbapenin, these are the you know, the, the basic of our antibiotic therapy in, in hospital. Uh, and the beta-lactam antibiotics are going to uh, destroy the cell wall of the bacteria. Then, um, and we know that the cell wall has the peptidoglycan, the cell wall is structured, the bacteria, the bacteria cell wall doesn't work, then because of the osmotic pressure, the bacteria is going to die. Then, to understand resistance, or what's going on today with multi-resistant, probably we need to have a, a, a better, we are going to concentrate on the cell wall of the bacteria. And we know that the cell wall of the gram-positive is different to the cell walls of the uh, gram-negative. And if I were to um, zoom there into the cell wall, uh, there is the cell membrane. You imagine that here is the cytoplasm, there is the cell membrane. Uh, it's going to be the cell wall, and most bacteria has a, a capsule. Then what happens with the, with the cell wall? There's the cell membrane, there are certain uh, proteins, for instance, carrier proteins that bring uh, proteins into the bacteria. There are efflux pumps that eliminate from the bacteria toxins. Uh, and then the, the transpeptidases, because the, the peptidoglycan of the cell wall is forming the cytoplasm and is moved through the, through the cell membrane. And these transpeptidases, these are enzymes that we call penicillin binding proteins, because these are the enzymes that all the beta-lactams are going to attach and are going to destroy the bacteria by altering the cell wall. Then this will be the, the penicillin binding proteins that we know that there are different types of penicillin binding proteins. If we look at the gram-positive organisms, some of the multi-resistant gram-positive organisms, in the hospital we think penicillin resistant staph aureus, vancomycin resistant enterococcus. Then uh, for the gram positive, we know that the peptidoglycan is a thick wall and the cell wall is all peptidoglycan. Then we have the cell membrane, the peptidoglycan, the capsule. <clears throat> but in the case of the um, gram negative organisms, we know that the peptidoglycan is, is a thin membrane, uh, but then the, the gram negative has the, the characteristic that they have another membrane. Uh, and remember that there was the the outer membrane. Then we have two membranes for the gram negative organism. Um, the cell membrane, the outer membrane. This gives uh, what we call the periplasmic space. And the periplasmic space is a critical area for what we are discussing now resistance in uh, gram negative. Yeah, because we need to, uh, most of the action happen in the periplasmic space. <clears throat> Outside of the um, outer membrane, we have the lipopolysaccharide, these lines of lipopolysaccharide, that this is the endotoxin. And we all recognize that gram negatives, the endotoxin, septic shock, and the pathogenesis with all the, 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 the endotoxin uh, here. <clears throat> then, uh, as we uh, discuss, then um, this will be MDR gram positive, MRSA, vancomycin resistant, enterococcus. Uh, MDR gram negative, uh, Pseudomonas, Acinetobacter, some of the Klebsiellas, E. coli. And let's go into a little more uh, detail uh, how is that this multi resistant uh, happens. Then we go to the uh, gram positive, then the peptidoglycan. And I'm going to use vancomycin, that is our 
traditional antibiotic for uh, gram-positive uh, resistance. Then we know that, that uh, vancomycin, we give vancomycin, vancomycin goes to the uh, cell wall, and vancomycin attach here. The, the peptidoglycan is glucose and amino acid. And here at the beginning of the membrane, you have this amino acid that is D-alanine, D-alanine. And this amino acid is where the vancomycin attach. And then the cell wall is going to be damaged. This is the way that vancomycin will kill the, the MRSA. Um, now, vancomycin, we know there has been an amazing story because we've been using, using and abusing vancomycin for 30 years. And still, MRSA has a difficult time to figure out vancomycin. But, 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 but what happened with, the, with MRSA and vancomycin? Even though it's unusual to have vancomycin uh, resistant MRSA, we know that one thing that has been happening is that the MRSA has been increasing the MIC to vancomycin, what's called the MIC creep. Because if we were to look at the MRSA at the University Hospital 20 years ago, the MIC that we have to kill MRSA was less than 0 0.5 micrograms per ml. But then it was 0 0.5, then it was 1, then it was 1.5, and now we have some MRSA that the MIC is 2. Still in the susceptible range, still is an MRSA is susceptible. But we can see that the, the MRSA is moving. It's finally figured out vancomycin. How is that the MRSA is increasing the MIC? Then what the MRSA is doing is increase the synthesis of peptidoglycan, and it's more difficult to the vancomycin to transfer the, the essentially the cell wall to get into the receptor site. And this is an important mechanism of increasing MIC. Then you make the, the antibiotic more difficult to get into the receptor. But then there are other gram positive, for instance, the enterococcus, that figure out vancomycin very clearly. And now we have vancomycin resistant enterococcus. Then it's a matter of going through. Uh, and of course, all these uh, organisms, we always think, you no, know, this is the MICU, the surgical ICU, bone marrow transplant, is because there is when we have the, the patients that are going to have immunocompromised, multiple antibiotics, and this is where these multi-resistant organisms are going to primarily produce damage. But we can, we all recognize that we can have a line infection for VRE in any patient in any part of the institution. Then VRE, <clears throat> here what happened is that the, the last amino acid here, instead of being D-alanine, now it's D-lactate. One amino acid change, 1,000 folds increase in the MIC to vancomycin. And you get an organism that is vancomycin resistant. This will be the vancomycin resistant enterococcus. Um, <clears throat> and there are different genes in the enterococcus uh, that produce vancomycin uh, resistant. Um, then this will be the, the mechanisms of primary mechanism of resistance for the uh, gram positive, to have an MDR gram positive. Now, let's go into the gram negative. Then we mentioned that is the cell membrane, the other membrane, the outer membrane, <clears throat> uh, the periplasmic phase. In the cell membrane, the penicillin binding proteins, and we know that these are the receptor for the beta lactam uh, antibiotic. Um, and if we uh, then discuss uh, the, the most important beta lactam antibiotic you know, for the penicillin, usually. Let me say, I just, I don't want to go through all antibiotics. You know, piperacillin tazobacter, very common, beta-lactam, beta-lactam is inhibitor, it was a penicillin. The, the cephalosporins, cetacean, cephepine, now we have new generation cephalosporins. Uh, the monobactam, uh, astreona, the, the carbapenem, imipenem, meropenem, doripenem, I mean, multiple uh, uh, carbapenems. I don't, I don't want to be all-inclusive. I just put some common uh, antibiotics. And we know that all these antibiotics are going to attach here and inhibit the enzyme penicillin branding protein. Then if I give a beta-lactam to a gram-negative uh, organism, we imagine that the beta-lactam travel to the porins, get into the periplasmic space, attached to the penicillin binding protein, and we kill the uh, gram-negative organism. Um, 
in which way the gram negative organism then is going to have acquired resistance. Um, and the most common way is going to be production of enzymes, beta lactams. Then we, I represent here this enzyme, the beta lactam, that's going to attach to the antibiotic in the periplasmic space. This is a big difference of gram positive, gram negative. The staph aureus, that's a beta lactamase to destroy penicillin, but the staph aureus throw the beta lactamase out into the environment to destroy penicillin. The gram negative, they don't throw it out. The gram negative concentrate the beta lactamase here in the periplasmic space, waiting for the beta lactam to arrive. Much better <laughs> uh, ability to use and have a high concentration of the, of the enzyme. Then, um, in which way bacteria develop gram negative, develop resistance to the, to the beta lactam antibiotic? Then you have the beta lactamase. Now, um, when we read about beta lactamases, we know that there are more than 1,000 beta lactamases described now for bacteria. And how do we do this just in one slide? I will probably put that there are four classes of beta lactamases, and these are the ones that are going to be mostly in the literature. Okay, this is not comprehensive, because these 1,000 different beta lactamases. But we know that, for instance, from the class A, uh, when we started, remember that we have penicillin for the streptococcus, and we didn't have anything for gram negative. Then we developed ampicillin for gram negative, and ampicillin for E. coli. And then we have the first generation cephalosporin, cephalosporin for gram negative. Now we are back in history here, no this is uh, 30 years ago. <clears throat> and then the E. coli developed resistance to ampicillin, because at the beginning, ampicillin, we used to kill all the E. coli, and every UTI was just ampicillin. Then the E. coli developed resistance to ampicillin develop a beta lactamase to destroy ampicillin. Um, this is what you read as the 10 beta lactamase. These are narrow spectrum. E. coli is destroying ampicillin. Uh, the name, the, as you read this 10 for Temorada, this patient in Greece, that this was the first beta lactamase uh, isolated. Um, but again, this beta lactamase destroy ampicillin, destroy cefazolin. It was narrow spectrum. Past time, now we're in the uh, 90s, and we created the second generation cephalosporin and the third generation cephalosporin. And then we're using cefotaxin, um, and then we have ceftriaxon. Then uh, the bacteria keep developing beta lactamase. And as we develop more and more broad spectrum antibiotics, the bacteria develop more and more broad spectrum beta lactamase. And then we come out with a extended spectrum beta lactamase, the ESBL. Now the bacteria has an enzyme that destroys first generation cephalosporin, second generation cephalosporin, and third generation cephalosporin. Broad spectrum enzyme. Then you say bacteria, just throw me whatever you want, I want to destroy with this enzyme. And these are the ESBL, multiple ESBL. This is the primary problem that we're having now in our region. Uh, ESBL bacteria, and the problem with the ESBL is that the penicillin and the cephalosporins usually don't work. Now, if you don't have penicillin, you don't have cephalosporins, then you have the last resource are the carbapenem. Then when you have ESBL, then we start using more and more carbapenem. Then, but until a couple of years ago, we said we have the carbapenem. But then, of course, history, now this, as we always discuss, it's never an issue if the bacteria is going to develop resistance. The answer is always yes. The question is how long it's going to take. It's never if resistance is going to happen. Then we knew that it was a matter of time, and then the bacteria develop beta lactamases that destroy the carbapenem. Um, and this will be the carbapenemase. And there are different classes of carbapenemase. In the class A, this is KPC, um, Klebsiella pneumonia carbapenemase, because it was initially described in a Klebsiella pneumonia. But we know that it's in a plasmid, and for Klebsiella pneumonia, this KPC now is in E. coli and it's in other bacteria. Then it's called KPC because it's the plasmid with the gene 
that when the bacteria acquire the gene, it's going to develop the protein, the beta lactamase, that's going to destroy the carbapenem. It's going to have the carbapenem. But you can have an E. coli with a KPC. <coughs> um, then, for instance, MDM, the New Delhi petal of beta lactamase. Then we know that in India was first recognized this gene that produced uh, the carbapenemase that is different because this gas sink. These are different, these are different classification because they, even though they destroy carbapenem, they have different characteristics. <clears throat> and this creates a problem for us is that sometimes we have antibiotics that now work against this carbapenemase, works against KPC, but may not work against MDM. Because even though the enzyme produce the same thing, destroy carbapenem, these are different enzymes. And we need to have different antibiotics. Um, then this is the, this, all these different type of beta-lactamases that are here. From the extended spectrum beta-lactamases and now carbapenemase. Uh, then we discussed that what are the most common gram-negative that we have all these multiple beta-lactamases? The most common gram negatives are Pseudomonas aeruginosa, Acinetobacter baumoni, Klebsiella pneumonia, and E. coli. Um, now, the, the, when we discuss this uh, KPC, this class A, um, then the Klebsiella pneumonia, E. coli, <clears throat> this is what is called the carbapenem resistant enterobacteriaceae, because we know that the enterobacteriaceae are the E. coli, Proteus, Klebsiella. Um, Pseudomonas acinetobacter are in a different group. These are the enterobacteria. This is the TRE, carbapenem resistant enterobacteria, or sometimes CPE, carbapenem is producing enterobacteria. What is the, the big deal of this CRE? Because we may say, well, I've been seeing Pseudomonas resistant to imipenem for the last 10 years. Um, then what is the big deal that now we have an E. coli resistant to imipenem? or a Klebsiella pneumonia resistant to imipenem. Well, we always discuss in rounds, the only person that get infected with a pseudomonas or an acinetobacter baumoni is the patient in the bone bon marrow transplant unit. Because pseudomonas, acinetobacter, are bacteria with very low virulence. And the only one that they infect is the person that is immunocompromised then none of us can have a pseudomonas pneumonia tomorrow. None of us is going to have a pseudomonas UTI because we are not immunocompromised. But now we have multi-resistant E. coli. What is the, now when you have enterobacteriaceae that are multi-resistant, this is what we start seeing with the ESBL. Now you have the healthy individual with a, we have the healthy, relatively healthy veteran with a prostatitis, with a gram negative, that's going to need a peak line and IV home antibiotics. Tomorrow we may have a healthy 25 year old female with an E. coli UTI that is going to be no antibiotics to treat. Because now we are having this enterobacteriaceae, this very common organism that infect any one of us that are developing multi-resistance. This is the, the <clears throat> this is the new game in town. Now we have multi-resistant gram negative that can infect anyone in the community. Um, and this brings the point that we're going to discuss that that in the past we were in the hospital and we we're dealing with pseudomonas and we carry the pseudomonas in our hands while we move from patient to patient but we'll never get pseudomonas pneumonia. Now when you carry one of these E. coli, tomorrow your UTI may be for the E. coli multi-resistant that is in the ICU. <clears throat> um, okay, this is one way, beta-lactamase. Another way that the gram negative have to destroy the antibiotic here or to uh, be become resistant is that they can decrease permeability. They the beta-lactam needs to go through this pore in the outer membrane. They close the pore, and essentially, there's minimal amount of beta-lactam going in. 
and some of the pseudomonas, they change the pore, beta-lactans don't get in. You may get fully resistant just because of a decrease in the uh, uh, um, pore. Uh, and the last one, this should be, and there are some genes <clears throat> that decrease permeability. And the last one is that there are some genes that the efflux mechanism, these pumps that are in the outer membrane, get activated. You remember, this pump here is to eliminate any toxin that the bacteria have inside, in the cytoplasm. Well, now they see this an antibiotic, another toxin. Let me develop a specific pump that whenever the antibiotic is in the periflactic space, I want to pump outside. Uh, <clears throat> then everything happened here, and then it's very clear. You see how you can move from a multi drug resistant to extreme drug resistant to pump drug resistant. Um, OK, then this has been a brief overview of the microbiology of uh, resistance. Now, um, how is that? Uh, and I want to simplify very much here. I want to say that let's assume that every multi-resistant organism has a single pathogen. And our patient is admitted to the hospital uh, today. And I may say, no, any one of us is admitted to the hospital today <clears throat> because trauma. Because every time that you make rounds in the unit, you can see yourself. Because any one of us is going to have trauma in 71, and you can be in the trauma unit tomorrow. Then, then any one of us can be in the intensive care unit very sick tomorrow. Um, and we don't have a CRE in our flora. But then, how could it happen that after three weeks in the hospital, we die of CRE sepsis? Uh, well, uh, what is going to happen is that <clears throat> first, somehow, we need to get CRE. If this is an old Klebsiella pneumonia, carbapenemate resistant. But again, you change CRE for MRSA or pseudomonas, whatever. You, you change the multi resistant organism that you want to put in the pathogen. First, you need to acquire the CRE. But still, you may say, well, now this, um, uh, I have a, a VRE. But this vancomycin resistant enterococcus, but I have all my enterococcus that are still non resistant. Well, then you are going to have the, every enterococcus is going to be VRE, or any Klebsiella is going to be a Klebsiella, a carbapenem resistant uh, Klebsiella. Uh, then you're going to develop infection, then you're going to develop sepsis <clears throat> and uh, death. Um, then this will be the, the simplistic, this always happens. This pathogenesis always happens. Then, uh, and now I'm going to take the last uh, 20 minutes to say, what can we do for this? And this is what we do uh, every day. Then, what are the options for action for each one of these uh, steps? <clears throat> the steps that we mentioned. First, the person arrives without a multi-resistant organism. Uh, and we know that the first thing that's going to happen then is that <clears throat> the person is going to be colonized with a multi-resistant organism. This is the first step in the evolution. Then, for Klebsiella pneumonia CRE, negative to CRE positive. From where this CRE is coming from, or you're in the hospital, this CRE is coming from a patient that is in the hospital with CRE. Um, and this patient gives the CRE to the environment, to a healthcare worker, and this is how the patient gets it. Now, we know that. We can get it from the environment. We are the patient. We can get it from the environment. Chances are that we get it primarily from a healthcare worker. And we know that we are going to get it from the healthcare worker from the hands of the healthcare worker. Now, some organisms are primarily are so much in the environment that we can get it from the environment. Rostrium difficile, vancomycin resistant, enterococcus, they, are, they live very well in the environment. We can get it, MRSA. Um, then, how do we break this? The first thing is that we need to recognize anyone that has a multi-resistant organism. And this is what we discuss with identification or isolation. Identification may be passive identification, as like we're doing um, then. If you send a culture, microbiology is going to tell. Or maybe active identification. You get to the VA hospital, they got to get nasal swab, PCR, to see if you have MRSA. We are actively looking for an MDR organism. Um, now, um, 
If you're going to do uh, uh, passive or active, it all depends on what happened in your uh, institution. Um, there is the possibility of preempting isolation, the possibility that this particular patient arrives from a particular area, the person goes in isolation until we figure out you have a multiple resistant organism or not. These are different options. And there is even the possibility of decolonization. The person who has a multi-resistant organism will try to remove the multi-resistant organism. Uh, these are all things that we discuss in infection control. These are everyday discussions to what to do, how to manage uh, MDRO in a particular uh, institution. Once the organism is from the patient in the object or, or here, then uh, environmental decontamination, another big topic nowadays in infection control. Um, how to clean the environment. Uh, because these organisms, some of these organisms tend to live for a long time in the environment. And we know that there are data that if this room has a multi-resistant organism and this room didn't have a multi-resistant organism, patients that get admitted to rooms where patients in the past has MDRO are at a higher risk of getting MDRO. Then if the person that was in this room before has Clostridium difficile, the room was clean, you get admitted in the same room, you have more chance to get Clostridium disease. Then we know that these organisms, some of these, survive in the environment after, quote unquote, we clean the room. And there's a lot of uh, action now to see what better uh, the contamination. And then, of course, the contact precautions that every time that you go to a room, you need to see the signs in the door to see if there is a sign, contact precaution, because we know that then gowns and gloves are going to be an addition of what we do. And, and it's going to be probably the sign, it's not going to say the patient has a pseudomonas multi-resistant or a, the sign is going to be a color or say contact precaution. Um, now, how the sign is going to look, again, it's going to be different from different institutions. People have different discussions. And I say this because even though we run the infection control antimicrobial program at the university and at the VA, we have different um, uh, signs or, or different uh, consideration for isolation. Now, if this patient that I know has a CRE, what happens if I don't know? And this is a patient admitted for uncontrolled diabetes, we are giving insulin, and I don't know that he has a KPC, um, a Klebsiella pneumonia. Well, then essentially, all these tend to disappear because I don't know. The patient is moving around the hospital, and I don't know that he has this KPC. I didn't know that he you know, just came from New York City and was admitted to one hospital where there were a lot of KPC, and now he's here at the university hospital. Um, then, how do we break? the circle uh, there. How do we stop uh, uh, these multilateral resistant organisms to colonize these patients? And this is why we have standard precaution. Um, <clears throat> then, uh, anyone here you know, practicing for some time, this, remember we have the universal precaution. Now, universal precautions was the idea that, well, we started with the HIV epidemic, and we say, okay, stop. Everybody in the hospital is HIV infected until proven otherwise. Any contact with blood, I want to use blood. And we need to protect ourselves. Well, now we go one step further. Anyone in the hospital is colonized with a multi-resistant organism. Doesn't matter if infection control identify the patient or not. Anyone in the hospital has a KPC until proven otherwise. How do you disprove it? How are you going to do? It culture all the stool, going to be deep in every patient, then everybody has a multi-resistant organism. Then what do we do? Before you get into the room, you wash hands. When you get out of the room, you wash hands. Every time that we touch a patient or touch the environment of the room, we wash hands. Um, this is the idea of standard precaution. Um, and the concept of hand hygiene. Again, universal precaution, we go 20 years ago, we need to wash hands, where, where are the sinks, where are the soap, but remember that, but now this, the hand sanitizer, now this is the alcohol. Now there is no excuse. You squeeze, then it's hand rubbing before going in, and after you go up. It doesn't matter if there's no signs on the door. This is 
why it's called standard precaution. This is a standard. Then, uh, and this is, and, and the hands of our hands is the only thing that is no discussion that transmit multi-resistant organisms. All the other things, is the, the literature is controversial. No, it's going to be the, the tie or the, you know, the state, of, everything is controversial. The hands, this, this 20 studies proving that the hands transmit uh, organisms. Then um, uh, everybody in the hospital is colonized with a multi-resistant organism until proven otherwise. The difference is that we may know, and then you have a sign, or we may not know and you don't have a sign, standard precaution. Uh, colonization, okay. Now, <clears throat> what, is the, what is the Joint Commission wants for hand washing before in and out of the room? What is the standard? 80%, 90%, the standard is 100%. If we don't have 100% compliance, you don't meet the standard. Now, it's not rocket science, because every time that I go to a room, this patient may have an organism that we don't want in our hands, and we don't want in our cell. Then this is a two-way, standard precaution is a two-way thing, is protection of the patient and protection of us. It's very simple. <clears throat> then you don't want to get a multi-resistant Klebsiella. <clears throat> and again, sorry, and again, the, the issue here is that, that, that in the past, the pseudomonas was just from another patient. Now, this is, this is self-protection. This is protection of the patient, a self-protection, because this multi-resistant Klebsiella tomorrow can be the cause of your appendicitis. Because once you have the multi-resistant E. coli, when you get admitted with this appendicitis, someone is going to say, oh, let's give some ampicillin, survive some treatment. No, you may have an appendicitis with a, with a bacteria that's going to be resistant to all beta-lactam <clears throat> And again, the idea is that we want to protect the patient, we want to protect us. It's a win-win situation. Um, prevention of selection. <clears throat> um, and I took extra time with hand washing because I wanted to, because this is part of our education. <laughs> Or hand washing. Then I'm going to run through the other ones. The other ones we can discuss. They are more, more uh, uh, patient oriented. <clears throat> um, you have one Klebsiella. How is that you became with every Klebsiella CRE? You killed the susceptible Klebsiella. This is very simple. You have one BRE, but your, all your enterococcus are not BRE. Well, let me give you something to kill the enterococcus. And every enterococcus that you're going to have is going to be BRE. Then this is collateral damage with antibiotics. Now, it's interesting. It's not that when we use inappropriate antibiotics. No, every time that we use antibiotics. The patient has pneumonia, has a legionella pneumonia, and you use a macrolide. Still, this collateral damage. With every antibiotic, we are killing normal flora. Uh, and the normal flora is this concept of colonization resistance. The normal flora doesn't allow flora that is not normal to get colonized. But if we kill the normal flora, your colonization resistance decreases, and then you're going to be easily infected. What do we need? Antimicrobial stewardship, optimal use of antibiotics, primarily de-escalation. I mean, we need to use antibiotics, but let's use the narrow spectrum possible. Uh, and then there's more and more microbiome intervention, because essentially antibiotics disrupt the microbiome. Uh, and this is a topic that, that in the next couple of years we are going to have more and more uh, in the literature. Now, one thing that microbiome now points, there is no question that we have a fecal transplant, microbiome intervention. Uh, there are plenty of studies assuming that this is better than vancomycin for recurrent uh, CDI. But now, uh, in this uh, recent study, uh, this month in gastroenterology, now even better than uh, fidaxomycin. Then, fecal transplant is any, that, any antibiotic that we can use for recurrent CD, with numbers that are always more than 90%. That brings the point that, that, that bringing back the microbiome, bringing back the normal flora, is a critical element. It's going to be critical in this fight against multi-resistant organisms. A lot of research in this area. Now, prevention of infection. Now, the person is infected. The person is heavily colonized. This essentially, you know, BRE in every culture in the, in the stool, in the oropharynx, and it got BRE all over, or Klebsiella. How do we prevent infection? And this is an area that's been evolving, again, the last 10 years a lot, prevention of 
healthcare or serious infection with all what we have, all the care bundles. And the care bundles are not there for any reason. Care bundles, again, study after study, I don't want to go through all the literature to say that care bundles prevent infection. Um, then, uh, for instance, you know, the, the ventilator shaded uh, bundle or the VAP prevention bundle, whatever we want to call it. We started years ago, prevention of the head of the bed, 45 degree, daily sedation, vacation, the peptic ulcer disease prophylaxis, this venous thrombosis. This was the initial one in every hospital. And the number of VAP decreased. Now, um, there was some confusion because this one is to prevent aspiration. This one is to try to uh, remove the patient from the tube. This one uh, really is uh, GI bleeding happening in patients that are on a ventilator, respiratory failure. This is not to prevent the, the, the ventilator of pneumonia. This is to prevent poor outcome patients with ventilator of pneumonia, saying that DVT. But again, it's a bundle that you put together trying to improve the outcome of this type of patient. Then a lot of things are in the bundle. I know that at the University of Louisville, now we have like 10 points in the prevention bundle. But these bundles definitely prevent, then the person may be MRSA colonized, may have MRSA in the oropharynx, may be at risk for MRSA pneumonia, but we definitely with the bundles prevent a lot of ventilator cell pneumonia or other forms of infection. Finally, um, prevention of poor outcome. The patient has the infection. Now, if you have the pneumonia with this, uh, or you have the line infection with this CRE, uh, with this Klebsiella pneumonia, that is resistant to uh, carbapenem. Um, <clears throat> with this infection, everybody has poor outcome. If you have a Klebsiella pneumonia susceptible versus a Klebsiella pneumonia resistant, you're going to have poor outcome for pseudomonas, for all the, the organisms. Um, and the problem here, of course, you have these multi-resistant organisms. We know that when you have an infection in the hospital, you have to give the right antibiotic at the right time, as early as possible. It's very difficult to give the right antibiotic empiric therapy when the cause of the infection is an organism that is resistant to 90% of the antibiotics that you're going to use. Um, but, but again, we, then on one hand, to prevent colonization and selection, we want narrow spectrum. But to prevent death once you have sepsis, we need to have broad spectrum. And this is the balance of the antibiotic use. Now, here, when we are always coming, the bacteria develop new enzymes, we develop new antibiotics. And I don't want to go through the, this, but there are new uh, uh, improved uh, uh, vancomycin, glycopeptides. Now we have new uh, vancomycin, we have new beta-lactam now, for the first time, a beta-lactam that attached to the penicillin binding protein of the MRSA. Then essentially, we have the first beta-lactam that covers MRSA. Uh, we have a new tetracycline, pleuromutilins that, that, that have uh, activity against you know, even the pneumococcal multi-resistant. Um, for gram negative, we have new beta-lactam that usually use our combination. This is a new cephalosporin with activity for, for pseudomonas with an old beta-lactam inhibitor. This is an old beta-lactam with a new beta-lactam inhibitor, an old carbapenem with a new beta-lactam inhibitor. And this beta-lactam inhibitor Start, are now are resistant to some of the beta-lactamases that are even carbapenemase. Then we start developing some inhibitors to the new carbapenemase. Again, there's not a single one that can say this cover all. This is the challenge here. Now we have to be thinking what are we going to be using. There are new tetracycline, there's new aminoglycosides. Because in this plasmid, if the bacteria has a carbapenemase, Chances are that in the same plasmid, there were all these aminoglycoside modifying enzymes, and this bacteria also is going to be resistant to gendamycin, tobramycin, amicacin. They were coming with new aminoglycosides that are going to be susceptible to these multi resistant uh, organisms. <clears throat> Finally, even if the patient <clears throat> dies for this multi resistant infection, then we still, from <clears throat> in, in we need to do an epidemiological investigation. We always need to evaluate what happened from our perspective. And the epidemiological investigation, either you have, an, you have to do an outbreak investigation, if there were more cases than expected of this. <clears throat> now, this is the point. What is an outbreak? This is more cases than expected. For us in infection control, this is straightforward. Okay, then how many cases of 
How many patients have died of CRE at the university hospital or at the VA hospital? We have zero. Until now, we have zero. If tomorrow you have the first patient that died of CRE pneumonia in the medical ICU, we have an outbreak. We have more than expected. What do I expect next month? Zero, because we do have this problem yet at the university hospital. Then, at the same time, any patient that died with an infection, due to an infection, is a sentinel event. Um, and then we need to do investigation to try to, no, to, to guide what do we need to do to improve our control and prevent. Um, then what you end up having is what is an MDR hospital program with elements of infection control, surveillance, isolation, antimicrobial stewardship, all the prevention bundles that we, every month we evaluate how do we do with the compliance with all the, the bundles, the, the optimal uh, management, um, and, and this is why, you know, we want to be involved as infectious diseases consultants in the management of these patients, and then epidemiological investigations that, you know, in our hospital epidemiology program at the University Hospital at the VA, we try to investigate to see what can we, what process can we improve and attempt to prevent poor outcomes with multi-resistant uh, organisms. Uh, and, and then essentially what, what people discuss is we need to have this culture of safety for multidrug resistant uh, organisms. Uh, we need to promote infection control. We need to promote uh, optimal antibiotic use. And, and whenever you read about this topic, there's always the idea what happened with the hospital administration. Uh, and you know, I'm happy to inform you that the hospital administration of the University Hospital, the VA hospital, have been very supportive of the ID division, the infection control program, antimicrobial stewardship. We are in an environment, I think that probably this is why we still don't have the problem of the TRE uh, here. Um, but, um, uh, and, and part of this program is education, um, standard precaution, hand washing, and this same part, what we have done in the last uh, 45 minutes. Thank you very much. Um, well, this is, uh, this is an everyday discussion, uh, what to do in one patient to do it. It has to be probably some form of hospital policy uh, with, a, with an infection control uh, policy. For instance, um, at the VA hospital, we check for MRSA, any person that gets admitted to the hospital. And MRSA is considered an organism that goes to contact uh, isolation. At the university hospital, we have decided not to, I, not to put in contact any more patients with MRSA. There we have two hospitals with two different uh, policies. One is active surveillance, the other no. I may say that, that it's always important if you, uh, and I don't want to mention you know, any particular uh, um, uh, institution, but we know that, that we know where these organisms uh, uh, live. But if the patient is coming from a particular institution or you have the patient had multiple antibiotics that been in intensive care, is a transplant patient, uh, and you want to do surveillance culture for this uh, type of patient, I may say that you have to you know, individualize. Um, and it's going to <laughs> the idea is that, that for two reasons. If the patient is colonized with a multi-resistant organism, definitely we are going to go for contact um, uh, precautions, uh, and then it's going to be important from the perspective that if this patient develop a nosocomial infection, then we are going to be more prone to cover for multi-resistant uh, organisms. Um, on the other hand, this data from the medical, then for instance, it's very common in, in medical ICU sometimes the patient is intubated, 
for trauma unit, and the patient is trauma, and you know it's high risk for nosocomial pneumonia. The idea that, okay, every twice a week, we are going to get a tracheal aspirate, and we're going to see what is the patient's colonized with. And then you say the patient has a pseudomonas or the patient has a multi-resistant organism. And the idea there is that this surveillance twice a week is to see if the patient develops nosocomial pneumonia and they have a pseudomonas resistant to cefepine. Well, I'm not going to use cefepine in my empiric therapy. Um, there are all these, but, but again, to have this standardized, usually it's a discussion with the, you know, a discussion with infection control with the hospital to see what is the risk benefit in which way we're going to do it, um, this was, can be done through tracheal aspirate. For this CRE, the idea is the swab of the rectum. And as a matter of fact, a Forrest did a point prevalence study here. Um, it was what, last year? To, <laughs> to me, everything is last year. <laughs> 2014, that essentially we're, you run through 250 patients and rectal swab to see if one, if only one of these multi-resistant genes were there. I, if I remember correctly, we didn't have any uh, um, KPC or any, or any New Delhi beta lactam. We have other resistant genes, but no KPC. Yes. Um, and there were, there, were, there were patients that were essentially with multi-resistant genes, but none of these that we are very interested. But they were, he identified uh, 11 patients that were in the institution. Some were in isolation, but some were not in isolation. Then, uh, but again, out of 200, there were 11, no KPC was identified. Um, this is, sometimes you do these prevalence studies to figure out, you run one day to the hospital and say, what is our next step? Um, and, and now, of course, there's all these PCR that can identify these genes in one hour. The same that we do the PCR for MRSA, now we have PCRs that can identify this gene. Then, um, yes, uh, it's, a, it's a, a consideration. Yes. This is another area that, um, again, nothing that I see, for instance, with the FDA that is phase three, nothing that I see. Now, uh, if you are at phase one, phase two, I don't, I don't follow too much but nothing that is at this moment at phase three, because phase three is something that in one or two years is going to be in the market. It's not even there yet. But it's a definitely another, another consideration. Um, we are discussing uh, more and more the concept that, that we have the, yes, the, our human normal flora, and then there's the hospital flora. And, and the hospital flora is an area of, again, large interest in infection control uh, because um, in the same way that our bacteria develop resistant to antibiotics, the, the, the bacteria are also develop resistant to all the disinfectant that we use. Then in the same way that we have an antibiogram for our bacteria causing pneumonia, we may need to have an antibiogram or whatever is in the floor in the hospital to see what is going to be the best disinfectant, what is that that we can use to, to maintain the hospital environment. And we are discussing you know, this, because bacteria are developing resistant also to disinfectants and, and, um, uh, and then all this controversy of the UV light and peroxide and uh, how to best clean the, the, the hospital and, no, and also the, the designs of the hospital. This idea that these 90 degrees are difficult to clean, should ever be, everything should be curved, everything should be, I mean, how do we how do we develop hospitals that we're going to be able to clean uh, easy? All these, I mean, the environment is a big issue of, of research, yes. Yes, um, yes, once we have this, uh, let's say you have a, a pan drug resistant or bacteria resistant to only uh, one antibiotic, then yes, the, our only hope is synergy. Our only hope is that if we have a, a multi-resistant bacteria, 
what we go is okay it's resistant to everything then we say um, but it's again it's, it's different if the it is pseudomonas is uh, resistant to amicacin uh, and the you know the mic is more than two to amicacin is resistant to genamicin more than two resistant but it's different if the mic is four with mic is 400 because the MIC is resistant because it's four, then we say, well, let me use aminoglycans, let me use Q24, let me increase the dose, same that we do. Then to, you try to optimize the antibiotic, concentration dependent or time dependent. The carbapenem, all the beta lactams, you do constant infusion of, of beta lactam, and then you do the combination therapy, as you say, in an attempt to, to define if combination therapy may make an antibiotic, a bacteria is resistant, now susceptible. There's even the discussion that with this new multi-resistant organism, now for instance, we may have, okay, I have a, a meropen and verbobactam or, or septacin, abibactam, and this KPC is susceptible. But some people say, should we use monotherapy for this organism or this infection to be combination therapy to begin with, with the intention to preserve the last antibiotics that we have? Because we know that you use monotherapy for 14 days in a patient with sepsis in the unit, there's a chance that after the therapy, you have some organisms, the patient is cured, but some organisms that remain are resistant to this. Until now you're colonized with a new bacteria, then using combination therapy, even for the remaining of the flora, there's a lot of discussion. Uh, but again, combination therapy is our last resort. Uh, as you mentioned, um, uh, the synergy in the laboratory sometimes doesn't translate too good to, to clinical. Then we tend to use more and more combination therapy. Some people say even for the MRSA, the MRSA, you give vancomycin, it's susceptible. You get seven days, 10 days, positive MRSA, positive, and you give vancomycin, very susceptible. What happened? Then we tend to use more and more combination therapy uh, for multi-resistant organisms. Wow. <laughs> um, uh, the ideal situation, how MIC should be defined, is that you look at a lot of patients with this antibiotic, and this group of patients did well, this group of patients did poorly. What was the MIC for this patient? This would be the, the ideal situation. In real life, um, uh, this is not the, the case. In real life, the MIC, you, I, I simplistic, I probably say it's an arbitrary definition of microbiology, just to make it, it's not like this, but, you know, then, for instance, uh, the story of penicillin. Um, in the, when we started with penicillin, penicillin, uh, any amount of penicillin killed the pneumococcus. There was, then, and there, there was the time that the pneumococcus was not tested for penicillin because always accepted. Then, 0 0.006 micrograms of penicillin killed the pneumococcus. You look at the full pneumococcus all over the world, and 0 0.5 of penicillin kill all pneumococcus. Then it was simple to say, okay, 0 0.05 is the MIC. Below this is susceptible, above this is resistant. Then in the 80, we have a pneumococcus with an MIC of one. Wow, this pneumococcus is 10 times more resistant than in the past. And we used to call these, these are pneumococcus resistant. But then the clinical using ampicillin that was with MIC is dead, and the patient responds. Then we need to increase the MIC, to call it resistant an MIC of two. Then using penicillin or cephalosporin or MIC of two, the patient will get better. Now we have MIC of four. And then we keep using beta lactam, and now it has to be MIC more than four. Then we are learning what happened with the MIC, and we, finally we have an MIC that makes sense, that when we call it resistant, now you have a beta lactam resistant to penicillin, the patient is not going to respond. To make things more complicated, I finish, is that that, that for the streptococcal pneumonia, you may have an MIC for the lung for the beta lactam because beta lactam penetrates well in the lung. But the pneumococcus is causing meningitis, the MIC is different because the penetration is different. Then you have lower MIC for the pneumococcus in the CSF and higher MIC for the pneumococcus. Then the MIC is a moving target. <sighs> Get an ID console. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I 
I want I want the ID group to have Squeeze, 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 squeeze